¿Qué tal amigos? ¿Cómo están? Bienvenidos una vez más. El día de hoy estamos celebrando porque tenemos una vez más a Kenny del equipo de Manta Network, una parachain enfocada en todo lo que es privacidad. Entonces vamos a escuchar los avances que han tenido. Y bueno, Kenny, nice to see you. Welcome once again. Uh, nice to see that the project is moving. I saw you were down in Bogota, so... Uh, first of all, uh, how are you doing and uh, where are you located now? <laughs> yeah, doing great. Uh, thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. And um, yeah, Bogota was amazing. Uh, spent about two days there running the ZK house. We had some great attendees coming by. Edward Snowden was one of our keynote speakers. We had NIM, uh, we had Aztec, Zcash, scroll, all sorts of ZK projects, all sorts of privacy projects. So overall, it was an amazing event. Um, but yeah, two days in Bogota now back in New York. Amazing. Uh, different weather? <laughs> um, you know what? Kind of the same. Oh, really? I, I know like Bogota is supposed to be super rainy right now, right? But like when I was there, it didn't rain either of the days. So it was perfect But because we had the conference venue outside. And so I was actually really scared that it's going to rain because everyone was around the picnic area. Um, but yeah, so it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience. Great weather, great people, great talks. Yeah. That's great. And uh, well, talking about all that, I saw you were creating, uh, launching a privacy allow a, a alliance with many other privacy focused projects. Uh, maybe can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, you know, when you think about like the recent tornado cash incidents with OFAC and the sanctions and then you know, a lot of sort of Web 2 policies trying to be applied to Web 3 and infringing subsequently on people's privacy, um, it becomes a really big problem. Right. So like what we noticed is, you know, whether it's us or Secret Network or NIM or Aztec or Zcash, et cetera, et cetera, we are basically spending the same resources, the same energy doing the same things when we're basically, we're making each other, um, I guess, progress redundant, right? So for example, one thing is educating the space. Why is privacy important in Web3, right? We educate people, Secret educates people, NIM educates people, et cetera, et cetera. We all say the same thing, right? And so like, that's one redundancy. And then the other one is um, the, the legislation, the legal, the compliance, the research we need to do to keep up with all the relevant sort of developments on the regulatory side, right? Like we spend money, we spend time, we spend energy doing this research, but we're all asking the same questions and we're getting the same answers. And so, you know, the, the UPA, the Universal Privacy Alliance, was something that um, just kind of started as a conversation between us and NIM and Secret. We were just kind of chatting about it and um, got a little bit more formalized and decided, hey, let's pool together resources so we can really drive on Web3 uh, privacy uh, moving forward and educating the space, educating regulators, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yeah, that's how it was formed. Amazing. Uh, I think that's a, a great move from your side. And uh, uh, like you mentioned, like this uh, Tornado Cash Uh, event has risen to attention many things and uh, I wanted to hear your opinion is is that uh, something that you keeps you up at night what do you think about this uh, past events with, with the tornado cash and how do you see the the future of privacy focused projects yeah I think privacy especially ZK is a huge Uh, underestimated area right now for Web3. I think without it, without either, it's not going to be scalable to like the billion users that we want to achieve, the three to five billion users, right? And so, you know, how do I think about the privacy side, especially on the regulators? Um, definitely need to be conscious about it because we do, I don't think at the end of the day, anyone wants bad people to be doing bad things in Web3, right? Like, I think we all want to find some sort of like, Um, a, a common ground, but you, you know, like is, does current regulation and the way that current regulation works, does that easily apply to web three? I think if you try to apply web two regulation blindly to web three, then there, it's going to break a lot of things, right? I think two examples here, one is tornado cash. 
tornado cash, OFAC sanctioned tornado cash, the smart contracts, right? Rather than the individual wallet addresses. And if you look in like FinCEN regulations, you can see, you know, like FinCEN says, okay, you can do anonymous things as long as the anonymous things are not illegal. And we know that despite the fact that, you know, um, there is money being laundered through tornado cash, yes. But at the same time, there are a lot of good players, good actors, innocent people doing very legal things on Tornado Cash too, right? Hiding their crypto payroll from their, you know, colleagues, for example. But by sanctioning the entire, you know, smart contracts, then now even the good players, the innocent people are swept up under that regulation and they are now, you know, somehow implicitly involved. Uh, and so that's a really big problem, right? And so like, that's one example of taking Web2 regulation and applying it to Web3 without understanding of how Web3 works. Uh, another one is like Celsius. When you look at the bankruptcy documents, right? Like Celsius had to report everyone's names and all this stuff. That stuff is fairly typical in a bankruptcy filing. Uh, and to be fair, right? Celsius did a really good job in trying to protect as much user information as possible. So like emails, physical addresses, et cetera, weren't published. But at the same time, you know, when you apply it to Web3, then anyone can just look through those records, look at on-chain transactions on block explorers, and essentially identify and link wallet addresses to individuals, right? Anyone with an internet connection can download the Celsius bankruptcy documents, and they can look on Etherscan, right? And they can combine the two. And so it, it becomes a really big identity and privacy issue. And so ultimately, right, I think these are two examples of, you know, like, when you think about regulation, right, the, the intentions, I hope, are good. But uh, the execution definitely needs some more education, which is why I think like the UPA is really critical for this. Um, and then on the other hand, right, like what is the role of Web3 privacy, right? Is privacy important? Does it matter? Definitely. It's, it's critical because, you know, um, even on a governmental level, right, people are thinking, oh, governments will not want privacy on the blockchain. Well, if that's the case, then blockchain's useless. Because otherwise, right, like if, if you're the United States, for example, um, then without privacy, then any other enemy of your state, right, whether it be, you know, on your sanctions list, I don't know, North Korea, Iran, Russia, et cetera, et cetera, they can all go in and see all of your citizens' data on Web3, and they can use that however they want, right? And so imagine if you have, you know, half the population in five to 10 years on Web3 applications. It becomes a massive surveillance tool for enemies of the United States. And I'm sh pretty sure the US government doesn't want that, right? Because that type of data is extremely important to protect, right? Uh, and so, yeah, I do think like privacy is a critical piece, not just on the user end, but like governments are, need to think about how they approach it as well. Yeah, that's a, a really good point. I always... Uh, uh also tell people like uh, if we want adoption from like big companies they cannot be just giving out their numbers they need a little bit of privacy so they can keep a competitive advantage in, in some points maybe so uh, I think privacy yeah. should be the standard and uh, that's why I wanted to ask you a little bit about Manta uh, maybe for the people who don't know exactly what Manta is you can break down a little bit uh, what's the focus? What are you building? And maybe tell us a little bit more about uh, zero knowledge that's on the on everyone's mind these days, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I think zero knowledge is a super hot topic. Um, this is very different than when we first started, right? When we first started Manta, um, we would talk about zero knowledge proofs and privacy and people would not really be too enthusiastic about it. But since then, I think the sentiments definitely changed. Zero knowledge is a very hot topic for investors, for retail, for consumers, for users, et cetera, right? Like everyone's got ZK top of mind. Um, so it's, it's really exciting because I think this is where the industry needs to be heading. And so having ZK as a, as a really hot topic is really, I think, important. Um, on the privacy side, what we're specifically doing is we're taking zero knowledge proofs and using it to create on-chain privacy. What this means is essentially any user who uh, transacts, let's say, for example, in the Polkadot ecosystem, um, transacts 10 dot to another user, right? All that's written, recorded. I can see who sent it, where it was sent to, when it was sent, what was sent, how much was sent, et cetera, et cetera, right? Tons of publicly identifiable information. Um, 
So what we do is we provide a shield on that so that when a user transacts through Manta network or Calamari network on our Kusama net, um, users don't or anyone with an internet access doesn't see all that information that I just described. All they see is a zero knowledge proof. And that zero knowledge proof is uh, uninterpretable. You can't get any information from it. And that is essentially your shield for creating private transactions, whether it be through tokens or NFTs um, on, on the Polkadot and Kusama ecosystem. All right. Uh, so what, what would it look like for, a, for an end user uh, the experience of using Manta in the backend, maybe like, so you can send NFTs, you can send tokens and leave no trace from where it came from and where it's going. Exactly. Yeah. And if you want to try it out for yourself, uh, we've got our testnet live right now. It's at app app.app.manta.network mm -hmm. for four dots. <laughs> so, okay. uh, but yeah, like try it out for yourself and you can see exactly what the end to end user experience is right now for private payment. Uh, right now for the test net, we've got it on um, private transacting of crypto assets and it's on test net right now. And first we're going to launch it on Calamari network, which is our Kusama Canary net. And then afterwards, we're going to get a Manta parachain and launch it on Manta network. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about Calamari uh, what's the status right now? What would you say are the main difference uh, currently? I know Manta hasn't gotten its uh, parachain slot yet. Calamari is, but uh, is there any different functions that each of the parachains have? Or Yeah, I think that... Um, so one of the things that we're looking at right now, just to, just to begin, right? For the first probably six months to a year, Manta Network and Calamari Network's products are going to look very similar uh, because we have the basic functionality, the privacy payments. We want to build out all the, the foundations, right? So like the laying the cement before we build the rest of the building. Uh, exactly what the rest of the building looks like for Calamari versus Manta, I think will be very different because the ecosystems are very different. Um, and so one of the things that we're thinking about and looking at right now is like layering on top of the privacy payment protocol use cases, uh, specific, um, I guess, consumer-based use cases that are more, um, I guess, um, accommodating for Polkadot versus Kusama. And those use cases can be entirely different. The functional technology, the zero-knowledge proofs behind everything will be the same, the one that governs Manta and Calamari, uh, but the use cases built on top of them, whether it be through XCM with other parachains or use cases that we build out internally, those will probably look a little bit different, but we don't anticipate that difference to really be noticeable until probably around a year from now. All right. And uh, how does it look like? Because you mentioned right now, it's a lot of utility for the, if you're inside the Polkadot ecosystem, right now some parachains already built uh, bridges to different uh, ecosystems like Ethereum. Uh, can those ecosystems leverage as well Manta? Yeah, definitely. Um, so right now we are working with other parachain projects that are EVM compatible, right? And so that means that, you know, the, the smart contracts that they're building and the tokens that they have that are ERC-20 or XC-20 in this case uh, would be compatible with Manta and Calamari also. All right. And there, is there any plans to implement uh, your own smart contracts in Manta or that's nothing, uh, not your focus at the moment? <laughs> That's, yeah, that's not currently our focus. I think, you know, like what we do really well with Manta and Calamari is the ZKP, the zero knowledge proofs, right? We've got world-class cryptographers. I think we're really well respected in the ZKP space. We are the leaders in innovation there. We've been building a lot, uh, making a lot of, uh, or hitting a lot of new milestones that are first of its kind in the world. Uh, and so we've been building our reputation, building our team, building our brand around the ZKP space. That's where we're good at, and that's where we want to focus. I think if we start to expand and distract ourselves with like the EVM side on the polka dot space, right? Like, it, we we already have so many amazing EVM like focused projects out there in polka dot and Kusama, and we'd rather just work with them and give them what we're really good at, so that we can build them like one plus one equals three sort of scenario with the entire polka dot and EVM ecosystem. All right. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, it's good to focus uh, on one thing only and, and make it as best as possible. So uh, great. 
what, how do you envision like the privacy ecosystem in in the future let's say the next three to five years do you think it's going to be a, a a trend are people going to be more uh thinking about more about privacy when they interact with this kind of stuff or is it like uh with other things like let's say other blockchains that aren't decentralized but people use it because of convenience they don't care it's it's a stoppable blockchain yeah <laughs> good question <laughs> well you know without getting too political about you know blockchains um i think at the end of the day what the user really cares about is convenience right like i think we see that with the amount of activity that happens in centralized exchanges versus decentralized exchanges the amount of activity that happens on centralized you know crypto applications versus decentralized crypto applications and use cases um and i don't think we're going to change that anytime soon right like i don't think we should change that i don't think we should ask users to jump through 10 extra steps to do a certain thing when they can just do it in two um and so you know that that kind of goes back to, you know, what role does privacy play in all this? I think the role that privacy plays is on the application level. And I think that's also one of the advantages we have as a parachain because we are able to work with other parachains and those parachains use cases that are built on top of them to enable privacy for those parachains and the subsequent applications on top. What that means is that the user would interact with these types of applications in the future and they don't they don't have to consciously think, oh, I need to turn on privacy. It's just there by default. And I was having this conversation with John from John Wu from Aztec. And, uh, you know, I think like he made a really good point that right now, the reason why privacy is, um, is so nefarious is because it's selective. People can choose to use privacy or not. And when you choose to use privacy, there's a friction. So not everyone uses it. Only the people who really, really have a reason to use it, use it. And, you know, sometimes those reasons aren't so great. And so as a result, we have this skewed sample uh, population of people using privacy that are leaning towards like, you know, bad purposes. And so if we make privacy um, by default, then it changes the it changes the game because now everyone uses it, whether or not you think about it. Right. And so like that, I think, really changes the narrative and the brand of what privacy empowers and enables and you know it, it, it moves more towards that fundamental human rights level yeah for sure i think uh privacy should be default uh for me sometimes it's scary to think that uh this public blockchains are just like databases that are ready for anyone to exploit at any time and use all that data for whatever they sit fit so Uh, I, 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 I'm grateful for projects like Manta that are trying to build these solutions. <laughs> uh, what, what excites you most? Like, what would you say is the thing that excites you most of the upcoming things that are you working on? Oh, man, I'd say, well, um, you know, like just kind of give you a, a quick debrief on everything that we've been working on, right? Like for all of you guys who are following us on our like Discord and Twitter, you've been seeing this barrage of all this information that we've been sending out because we've been working on so many things. We've been doing the Universal Privacy Alliance. We've been doing the migration over to not uh, delegated proof of stake. We've been doing the trusted setup. And so like, these are three of the really short-term things that I'm really excited about. Uh, the UPA I've already talked about, right? Um, the de delegated proof of stake, this is something that the community has been asking for for the past like, half a year we've been working on it nonstop, and we finally got it out and so on-chain staking on calamari is now live and we're going to be launching with delegated proof of stake for manta network as well and so that that really shifts the the security and the availability of the network to a much more decentralized manner uh so on the network side that's really ex ex uh, extremely exciting for me and then finally is the um the trusted setup so <laughs> Uh, so the trusted setup is a real, it's a mandatory process for launching, um, a, a zero knowledge proof circuit. So all of the privacy functionality that we built for Manta and Calamari in order to launch that out for Manta pay, which is our first product, we need to do a trusted setup ceremony. And the trusted setup ceremony is an opportunity for the entire community to get involved. Um, and they can, it's just a few clicks 
And then you essentially write one extra character into this long password that everyone gets the chance to write. All right. And so like, it's a really fun community activity. Everyone gets involved. And what we've seen is that, you know, for example, Zcash, they've gotten around 200 uh, participants in their trusted setup ceremony. For Manta Network so far, we've gotten about 1,000 registrations for our trusted setup ceremony. And we're on track to become the world's largest trusted setup ceremony in history. And we can break that milestone for the Polkadot and Kusama ecosystem specifically. And so for those of you guys who want to help make history here, definitely get involved in our trusted setup as well. Uh, how, do, how do you do it? Yeah, so um, there's a whole, there's a whole, I guess, link that I can send over. Uh, and it's on our Twitter as well. It's pinned on our uh, Manta Network Twitter account. And uh, all you have to do is follow the instructions there. It takes probably like three to five minutes at the most. Uh, that gets you registered. And once we have the contribution process started, then we'll send out a message to you and then you can start the contribution. So it's a two-part process. The first part is what's already on our Twitter account. It gets you registered. And the second part is the actual contribution. Once that's live, we'll send out a message. Then you go do contribution and yeah, that's it. Amazing. Uh, and... What, I saw that Tether and USDC are going to be launched on Polkadot soon. Uh, is that something that people will be able to leverage in Manta Network as well? Like uh, keep some privacy in it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I think that you know USDT and USDC launching in the Polkadot and Kusama ecosystem is critical, right? Like a like. First of all, stable coins are crit a critical component of like DeFi products, right? And any sort of like trading activity. And so having that fundamentally within our ecosystem, along with like the sort of algorithmic approaches that we already see with other uh, stable coins built within the Polkadot and Kusama ecosystems natively, right? I think that's really setting the foundation in this sort of market to build a great sort of DeFi future for Polkadot and Kusama. Um, specifically within like Calamari and Manta, right? I think our first priority is to make sure that we can build out use cases for the uh, parachains as well as for the users, right? So like our, our focus is less on privatizing crypto assets and even on the stablecoin side and more so trying to think about like, you know, uh, specifically enabling privacy critical features for, you know, what users want to see on other parachains and their use cases. So we're, we're definitely going to be prioritizing those over the USDC and USDT, at least in the short term. But that's not to say that, you know, we don't focus on it probably in the next like three to six months. Uh, and how does uh, like the users, what, how can they involve if, if they're holders of like Manta or Calamari tokens? What, what can they use them for to be involved in the mm -hmm. ecosystem? Is it for gas fees? Is it for also like governance? Uh, what other use cases do, do people have if they're holders if they supported the, the, the crowd loan? Yeah, so uh, the governance, the, the fees, as you mentioned, the on-chain staking, right? I think like those are three mm. of the critical use cases. Uh, I think the, the on-chain staking is definitely critical to the security of the network. The governance is critical to the future of the network and the fees is critical to the, the present use of the network. Uh, and so all those three together, I think, combine to probably 95% of the use case. All right. Yeah, because that's something that I think it's important uh, people to get involved in governance uh, with projects. I think that's what most attracts me from the Polka ecosystem is the, the governance. And it's going to be even better soon with governance 2.0. So... Uh, that's definitely something interesting to to see. Uh, what what uh, talking about Polkadot? How how have you seen the development for the past year that the first parachains launched? Uh, what's your feeling? What do you think it's missing, or what do you think it's doing well? It would be good yeah. to to hear your opinion on this, since you're a, a, a team building <laughs> in this ecosystem. Um, what do I think is missing other than privacy? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
um, no, I think so. So, I, you know, I think this is something that's been kind of discussed within like the polka dot Kusama communities, as well as with like the builders and the projects. And, you know, I think um, when when the when I guess the parachains first launched, um, because this is so new, right, like there wasn't too much guidance, there was a lot of sort of, you know, walking around in the dark, feeling things and trying to figure things out. And sometimes we felt a light and we could turn it on. Other times we felt a wall, right? And we, we didn't know where to go. And so I think like that's kind of analogous to a lot of the experience that parachain projects had. Um, but I think what has been really great and the improvements that I've seen on the parody side, right? Like, I mean, they've been a lot more focused on, you know, the, the, the parachain success uh, and and they've been focused on you know providing more guidance, providing more documentation, providing more strategy, et cetera, et cetera, to thinking about how to develop a parachain from like ground zero all the way up to maturity and launch. Uh, and so being able to kind of uh, have those sort of things in place um, not only I think is critical for the parachains in existence today but also it's uh, a very good signal for future projects and future innovation within the Polkadot ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, are you yeah, happy that uh, it has been getting easier to get a purchase slot? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I undeniably, I think everyone understands that like getting a parachain slot is pretty expensive, right? Like you have to give uh, a fairly large, at least originally you had to give a fairly large allocation of the token supply um, as well as you know the, um, the 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 cost in terms of DOT or KSM, right? I, I don't think like giving away a large percentage of the token supply to the community is a bad thing. I think it's a great thing, um, but I think it also you know there there needs to be more um, I guess um, uh, 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 rather than giving it all out at once in a very short period of time, right? Like it should be, it sh there should be more incentive, better incentivized to release to the users, right? It may not necessarily be, for example, you know, if you contributed to a crowd loan, um, then you just get 100% of your tokens without doing anything. There could be other activities involved, right? Maybe the more you use the main net, the more you use the test net, the more of the allocation you're, uh, you know, uh, qualified for. Um, you know, just just like incentives and different ideas that I was I've been thinking about. But like, um, yeah, ultimately, to answer your question directly, yes, I think it's, it's to everyone's sort of, um, you know, convenience that the, the cost of the parachain is lower. <laughs> nice. And well, I started to wrapping up. I wanted to ask you if maybe you have a, a possible date mm -hmm. for launch for Mantape and the that's <laughs> Yeah. So man to pay. Um, so uh, this goes back to the trusted setup. So if you guys are not involved in the trusted setup yet, please just go to our man to network Twitter and check out the pin tweet for all the instructions on how to do the trusted setup. Because before we finish the trusted setup, we can't launch man to networks, uh, man to pay on Calamari and, and on man to network, I guess, because it's using the same zero knowledge proof circuits. So uh, we anticipate that'll probably take approximately uh, one to one and a half months, and then we're finishing up the security audit simultaneously. And so uh, we are hoping to launch uh, Man to Pay on Calamari sometime this year. Uh, and then after that, we'll be looking at uh, building out additional use cases and exploring uh, Manta Networks parachain. Amazing. I'm excited for that. Uh, yeah, man. And uh, I don't know if you want to say something else. Uh that you have in your mind that maybe would be of interest <laughs> to people? Um, no, I mean, I think three key takeaways, right? Like uh, three three takeaways, two of which users can get involved in, right? Like the, the first one is um, the, the trusted setup, which, you know, I just talked about. The second one is the on-chain staking. I mean, we've got, I think, about 27,000 uh, Calamari wallet addresses, right? And so like definitely... Yeah. If you want to contribute to the network and maintain its security and availability, consider you know using those tokens to delegate to stakers. I'm sorry, not stakers to collators. Um, and then also, um, and, and to do that, you can just go on Calamari's Twitter account and then see the pin tweet there. 
Uh, and then the third one is the Universal Privacy Alliance, right? I think like this is just a, an amazing initiative overall for Web3. Uh, and I think this sort of education, this sort of conversation uh, needs to happen sooner than later. So we're really happy that we're driving it alongside like NIM and Secret and AppTech and Zcash and like a bunch of other top privacy projects and thought leaders. For sure. Well, Kenny, thanks so much for the time. Great talking to you. Uh, amazing job on what you're doing with Manta. Uh, I'm glad maybe this uh, tornado cash situation maybe sped up a little bit uh, all the all the the getting together from these privacy projects and uh, let, let's see what surprises come up in the future. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> it was just a conversation and having fun before, but then yeah. like we saw that and like shit got <laughs> serious real fast. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. And I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.